This is Medicare's biggest diagnosis. This is Medicare's biggest cost, uh, congestive heart failure. And basically, you're on the on the healthy heart, you see that the septum is relatively muscular and the left ventricular wall is relatively muscular. Uh, and the, uh, on, the, on the sick side, the uh, right atrium is ballooning out kind of thing. The, the vent left ventricle is ballooning out. The muscle is atrophied, basically. And so when you would take an x-ray of this, you'd see a heart that was really large, not because the heart is large, but because it's filled with blood that it's uh, not used to having in there because it's, it's become so floppy. Six to ten percent of those, those over 65, I mean, um, you know, with the aging of the population, this is going to be bigger and bigger, bigger challenge. And even now, they basically want you to look at 30-day readmissions because the, the fact of the matter is, is that this is not going to get particularly better. And uh, if you were to have a choice between cancer and CHF, in some cases you would choose cancer because your life expectancy may be a little bit longer if you have cancer than if you have CHF. You can see the mortality is 10% per year. Uh, this is pretty straightforward in terms of uh, the symptomatology, and I'm going to go into another slide that does this in a little bit more detail. When I was uh, getting out of residency, there was, like, there was heart failure. That was it. Uh, there was no differentiation between systolic or diastolic or heart failure. It was just heart failure. Systolic uh, dysfunction was pretty straightforward. The squeezing of the heart was not wh where it was up to be. And so when you were to measure with an um, ultrasound, uh, Doppler flow me uh, measurement, uh, you'd find that the, uh, the heart was only pumping out about 45% of what was in the, le in the left ventricular chamber, so that there was going to be 45% out. There's going to be a lot of blood left in that chamber, more blood's coming in to fill the chamber during diastole. So the next thing you know basically is there's a backup of blood because you can't pump it out. The heart's too weak, so it starts backing up on the, uh, into the pulmonary vasculature, and the next thing you know, um, the, the, the lungs are getting full of blood, the, um, they are, the capillaries are starting to leak, the alveoli are here, the blood vessels are here, the interstitial fluid is basically here, and it's getting more and more and more and more and more, so the distance between the two and the ability to exchange gas goes down, the lungs are now heavier because they're full of blood and, and this leaked out interstitial fluid, so the work of breathing becomes much harder. The work of breathing becomes harder, requires more oxygen, and you get it into this vicious, vicious cycle so that when you see somebody in pulmonary edema, they're just absolutely gasping for, for breath because this is just kind of spiraled down. And when we treat them, they kind of just spiral backwards. And, and, and within a short period of time, if you're lucky, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, they're going to be a lot, a lot better. Diastolic dysfunction, on the other hand, was, is uh, primarily the result of... Um, Muscular hypertrophy, hypertension, so the heart has gotten like uh, uh, very strong in terms of the, what the walls look like, but they've also become very stiff. And the, uh, and the left ventricular, because it's become so muscular, doesn't hold very much blood. So uh, the, although the pumping power may be fine, and it's pumping out 65-70% of all of what's, what's in the chamber, the chamber is not loaded with very much blood because the chamber is small and stiff due to the... Uh, hypertrophy of the muscles around it. So this is a kind of a, a reasonable picture about uh, the differentiation between these two, these two uh, disorders. Although, to tell you the truth, when we're going to try to fix it in the emergency department setting, we're not going to say, well, we're going to treat this one different than that one. They basically get treated the same. On a long-term basis, however, if you're going to try to treat somebody who has diastolic dysfunction, the idea was to make their blood pressure as low as possible so that, in fact, this, this hypertrophied muscle can, in fact, become less hypertrophied. Uh, on the uh, systolic side, you know, if you were to choose one or the other, systolic side says your heart just is too weak to pump out now, and whether there's ability to uh, salvage that or not is another, another matter. Uh, so this is kind of a summary of what I just mentioned, and it's, it's, you don't pump out 100% uh, when you squeeze your heart during a normal systole. You know, if you can get 65%, that's considered to be normal, and, um, uh, and when you get into the 40s, it's considered to be abnormal. This goes through the pathophysiology that I just uh, talked about in terms of this vicious cycle. Here's an x-ray that we're all really quite familiar with. The heart is enlarged. 
there's a, a um, fluid all over the place in terms of the stuff that's gotten into the alveoli. And once it gets into the alveoli, you've got to get a ground glass appearance because you've got fluid all over the place now. The, there's a prominence of the upper lobe vessels. Normally, there's a prominence of the lower lobe vessels. Well, there's a little reversal here, and so the upper lobe vessels become more prominent. The, the, the vessels at the hilum are prominent. And this is, this is, in the right setting, this is an easy diagnosis. Uh, when left heart is failing, when left heart is failing, the blood's backing up into the lungs, causing this respiratory distress kind of thing. Then it backs up onto the right side of the heart, into the right ventricle. And so the right ventricle is basically its ability to unload into the pulmonary vascular tree. That is compromised, and so the blood starts backing up, and next thing you know, you've got neck vein distension, uh, you know, uh, hepatojugular reflux, and peripheral edema. So it's just kind of this vicious cycle of blood backing up. Um, what, what is the cause? What brought them to you today? Well, um, there's a you know, pretty decent differential. Are they sick? Do they have some kind of infection? And it just doesn't have to be an infection in the lungs. It can be an infection someplace else, some, someplace that is stressing the cardiovascular system in terms of saying uh, we need to make the heart beat faster because we've got a fever in terms of we have a kidney infection or something like that. It doesn't just have to be a uh, lung infection. Or do you have some myocardial ischemia? We'll try to take a look in the EKG and see whether we see something like that. Certainly, if we have a new arrhythmia, that's not going to be good. Uncontrolled hypertension is kind of like, uh, you know, most common thing that you'll find. And you'll hope that, and pray that you do have a uncontrolled hypertension so that because we're going to fix that real easily. And as soon as we fix that, then the heart, all of this pathophysiology will, will reverse. If you don't have high blood pressure, then, uh, uh, and if you have a normal blood pressure or even a low blood pressure, that's otherwise known as cardiogenic shock. Um, and you all know that the mortality from that is not good. Obviously, excess fluid, everybody gets scolded for eating too much salt when they come in from uh, their uh, exacerbation, which it may or may not be the case. Um, anemia is going to be, and hyperthyroidism, same thing. Let's drive that heart faster, 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 faster. Anemia is going to be driving it to get more red cells out into the tissues. And the way you get more red cells out into the tissues is if you don't, if you don't have very many red cells, well, you circulate them more quickly. And, and so that's a stressor uh, in the setting. And the same thing would be true for hyperthyroidism, where you've got plenty of of, you know, you're not anemic, but you still got a, a heart that's, that are, that are driving it faster, 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 a thing that is not a good idea. And uh, you know that many people who have congestive heart failure on a routine basis now are taking beta blockers. You know, 20 years ago, he said, what? A beta blocker? Doesn't that kind of weaken your, your heart contraction? Well, the, the net effect actually is, is positive, and so the idea is to have a nice slow heart rate. Slow heart rates basically give you the time to pump out what you can pump out. So on a chronic basis, um, beta blockers is where uh, people have gone. Clearly, va va uh, valvular disorders, as people get older, they get, may get aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis means that's really, I can't unload the left ventricle <coughs> into... Um, into the uh, vascular tree because the, the aortic valve is stenotic or I got mitral regurg and so I'm, I'm squeezing and trying to pump blood out here, but I'm pu pu pumping it back into the left atrium as, as well. So that, those are problems. A any in inflammation of the heart, we'll talk about myocarditis uh, in, in a bit, uh, dissections, PE, uh, that, that may be a, uh, an, an etiology that, that, uh, that might have to be considered. And there are some medications that have been shown to uh, increase um, your likelihood of uh, failure. One of them being is uh, NSAIDs. We shouldn't be giving NSAIDs to grandpa for uh, his sprained ankle necessarily who has marginal fa failure. This is a drug that causes you to retain sodium in water and uh, it's not a great idea to be giving people who are prone or, uh, to um, heart failure uh, NSAIDs. It's really quite clear that they're not a good thing to do. Um, some of the pathophysiology of, uh, of uh, pulmonary edema is kind of very straightforward and kind of neat. So the idea here is I'm not pumping out enough blood, so I'm not oxygenating uh, uh, enough. And so the heart says, uh, the, the sympathetic nervous system says, well, I'll take care of that. 
I'll just make the heart beat harder and faster, harder and faster. We know that adrenaline will cause the heart to beat harder and faster. We also know, however, that when adrenaline's out, it basically causes vasoconstriction. Uh, as part of the, uh, uh, you, you get this package of effects. You just can't pick and choose the one you wanted. So in the process of getting this vasoconstriction, you uh, basically are not able to dissipate your heat because you're vasoconstricted, and so you start sweating. So a patient comes in and they're cold and they're clammy. That means they are highly uh, under the influence of adrenaline, and this adrenaline was attempted to try to fix the problem, but the fact of the matter is, is that in many ways it's counterproductive because you can, adrenaline will cause you some vasoconstriction. Yes, it'll be, make the heart beat harder and faster, but it causes some peripheral vasoconstriction. And... Um, so it's, it's, in some ways it's good, but it, it's, in, in a lot of ways it's not good. So we want to try to ultimately uh, uh, get, get rid of that. But when you see a cold, clammy patient coming in, they are really pretty far down the pathway of trying to physiologically result, resolve the problem that they're having, but it is not particularly, uh, uh, not particularly effective. Uh, testing, um, pretty straightforward. Yeah, you know, a chest x-ray, and, and it's going to be, is that pneumonia up there? Because we know that that could be a precipitant. Uh, I'm not quite sure, so then maybe we can measure the uh, BNP. And uh, if the BNP is uh, really low, well, you don't have uh, congestive heart failure, and if it's really high, you do. But the most of the time, we want to know the answer. It's going to, like, it's going to be in the gray zone. Is that, thing, uh, is that pneumonia, or is that congestive failure? Well, let's do the BNP, and we get a gray zone um, BNP results. So I know it's routinely done in many cases. I don't think it needs to be done. If it's an obvious case, doing the BNP is a waste of time. BNP is about right ventricular wall. Basically, when it gets stretched, releases this BNP into the bloodstream, and so that it's a marker. So you can see other things that would stretch the right ventricular wall would also cause this um, BNP to go up. What if you had a really nice big pulmonary embolism, and you're trying to unload from the right ventricle into the pulmonary vascular tree, but there's a nice big saddle embolism down there. So the blood, you're trying to pump down, there's the blo it's blocked up, right ventricle has started to become dilated, stretched, and BNP goes up in that setting. So it's not certainly not pathognomonic of uh, failure. Uh, yeah, EKG, we're looking for ischemia. They're, they're not going to have a no normal EKG, I can uh, pretty much tell you that. Uh, there's going to be tachycardia. This is this compensation for, I, I can't pump out as strongly as I like, so this is the adrenaline effect, the tachycardia that's going to go with it. You hopefully don't have any pathologic dysrhythmias like uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. You need the atrial kick uh, in this process. You need every, uh, every, <laughs> every chamber doing it what it's supposed to do. So the idea here is if you have onset of atrial fibrillation in the heart that is kind of prone to uh, failure in the first place. You could just push it over. So that's clearly something that would need to be uh, ascertained. That's obviously an easy di diagnosis to make. The chest x-ray, do we have uh, any concurrent pneumonia uh, in the process? We're not always sure because it's often hard. Now they have this ultrasound to make the diagnosis. They, they, they talk about these uh, B lines. These are not the curly B lines of uh, looking at the chest X-ray where you saw these, fi you know, fine little uh, uh, horizontally oriented lines at the periphery. These are called B lines, and uh, it's uh, supposedly, uh, you know, thickening edematous interlobular receptor. But the fact is that, and this is not a great picture, but it, the idea is you can see it looks like sun sunbeams, sunbeams kind of sh shining through on your um, on your ultrasound screen. And um, there are better, better pictures where it looks like the, the sun is coming through a tree kind of thing, and you see these beams of light coming through. This can be taught to doctors in a half an hour. There's been studies on, can I, make the, can I be taught, and how quickly can I make this diagnosis? A half an hour. This is like a no-brainer kind of diagnosis. It's one of those that those of you who are my generation who basically don't know ultrasonic of how to check the box, um, you can learn this. Troponins, are they going to be up or not? Well, you know, the, basically anything that's going to cause the heart to be under some kind of a strain, uh, you can leak troponins, and it doesn't have to be a result of an ischemic process. It could be like an inflammatory process. So you leak troponins. We're not really sure whether this means that we're having a, uh, a um, myocardial infarction. 
uh, you'd like to get a comprehensive metabolic panel, you know, like you know, what the BUN is, the sodium, and those kinds of things, and uh, uh, what's going on in the liver. But one of the key, key things we're looking for is what, what's the potassium? Because all of these people are on Lasix. Well, what does Lasix do? Lasix takes out, uh, you know, furosemide takes out, depletes your potassium. And not only does it deplete your potassium, which we know we need for, you know, decent muscular contraction, to deplete you of magnesium. We never me measure the magnesium. The, it's the forgotten iron, but the fact of the matter is, is that it is just as important, if not more important, in terms of the uh, efficient pumping of the, of the heart. So the idea is, oh, geez, we've got a low, low, low uh, K. I've got to fix that. Um, studies have shown that you will fix it more effectively and more efficiently if you give magnesium along with um, uh, potassium. Now, obviously, you've got to know what the uh, pe person's uh, creatinine is before you start doing that, but the replacement of Potassium should routinely be done in association with the potassium replacement of magnesium. That ion is down. We fix, fixing that ion will help you fix your potassium. Yeah, I had mentioned the, the, why the uh, anemia would, would be a stressor as well. And maybe if your right, white, white count's elevated, it may be indicating that you've got a pneumonia, but it could also be indicated because one of the uh, manifestations of high uh, adrenaline is uh, a, a bump in your white count. So we're going to put a monitor on them. Hopefully it's one of these monitors that is wireless so that you can just have the leads on a little belt pack and that's it, so that they're not connected to everything. Then there's this business about oxygen. Yeah, you measure the O2 sat, and if it's uh, low, you give supplemental oxygen. And it's, it, it's going to be probably on the low side, so it's, this is like... What Jess was talking about is like oxygen is kind of out if you have a normal SAT. Well, these people probably don't have a normal SAT, so the idea of giving them supplemental oxygen is, is a good idea. This idea of over-oxygenating is considered to be, well, you know, get them 94, 95, 96, that'd be terrific. But hyperoxemia basically has more recently been thought to be associated with, you know, pulmonary vasoconstriction, which you don't want to really have, and, uh, and, and peripheral, uh, increase in peripheral resistance. Now, how, uh, how important that is, it's kind of plus minus. Um, BiPAP and CPAP, absolutely kind of thing. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's been around for a long, long time now uh, to facilitate their, their breathing. And then the key uh, factor here is to unload them, which means please, please, please have a 180 over 100 blood pressure. Because once you, uh, if you have that, you, there's no way you can screw this up. So the bottom line is you start giving... Um, and, th and they are fluid overloaded, and, you know, they've got edema and that kind of stuff. So the idea basically is you give, give them some nitroglycerin and it's titratable. nice thing about it is you can go up fast, you can go down fast, you can shut it off. It's, it's kind of, you can balance about how much you need. Um, there are other things that people have used like sublingual captor control. Well, you can't, you know, uh, determine how much of that you need kind of thing. So it's, it's nitroglycerin. The nitroglycerin dilates the... Uh, the uh, arterial side, so it makes it so much easier to pump out now from the left ventricle. It's easy because it's got a nice dilated arterial system from uh, that nitroglycerin. And the, on the other side, it basically dilated the vein, so some of that blood that was coming back into the heart that was flooding the heart that was uh, heart was unable to handle is now trying to be accumulated into the venous system. So it does good things quickly uh, on both sides. The idea here is don't go too slowly on this. If you, uh, with the likelihood of you overshooting is rel relatively s uh, small. The other thing that people wind up giving is they give uh, Lasix to, uh, because if they're over, over um, uh, if they're edematous kind of thing. The idea here is one of the little secrets about Lasix is Lasix furosemide is a vasoconstrictor. And so the idea is as soon as you give it, initially it's a vasoconstrictor, then it, it becomes a vasodilator uh, a little bit down the road. So you don't want to give Lasix as the first medication that you're going to give in somebody who's having uh, pulmonary edema because the idea here is you, you don't want any vasoconstriction kind of thing. So the idea is you give the nitro first, then if you're going to be a purist about this, then you give the furosemide thereafter. Mm. Oh, yeah, the, the, I think the, the guy on the bottom there is kind of important because not all these people who have a pulmonary edema are, are overloaded with a, a fluid. And so the idea is what if you have a massive heart attack and all of a sudden your pumping power just goes to hell 
And so you, you're suddenly into pulmonary edema. Well, the, the, these people do not have large hearts. They have normal-sized hearts. They just, this, this came on them. They haven't had a chance for the heart to balloon out and get thin and all that other stuff. And they're short of breath because the heart is not pumping, so they've got uh, pulmonary edema. But the fact of the matter is, is they're not fluid overloaded. So these people don't need to have um, uh, IV Lasix to take care of them. That's not, that's not their problem. And if anything, you may be depleting them of, of some of, of what they do need. So the idea here is flash pulmonary edema it can occur in the setting of an acute MI. And uh, obviously, it's not a good, a good, good thing to have. Um, yeah, this is what the, uh, some of the other things that you can use. But uh, when it comes right down to it, uh, it's nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin. But these are some of the uh, um, ACE inhibitors that are also can, can be useful. Well, and they also have some other good effects other than just uh, you know, vasodilating. Um, myocarditis is basically an inflammation of the heart. It can cause, be caused by, most of the time it's caused by virus. And you get like a flu-like illness, a little fever, kind of myalgia kind of thing. And you get an inflamed uh, heart. And that uh, heart is... The heart only does two things. Basically, it pumps, and it pumps it with a rhythm. So you can have dysrhythmias and pumping problems. That's, that's it. It's a mechanical kind of thing. So the idea here is uh, you've got this compromised heart because it's infected. It's got a viral infection. Or it has a pro, you know, protozoal infection. It may have Chagas disease kind of thing. Or maybe, maybe there were some drugs that were caused it or alcohol uh, caused it. But in any case, you have a heart that is itis. It's, it's inflamed. Um, and in the process, picture of all the white cells that, are, that, are, um, that have infiltrated the uh, cardiac muscle. So you do have this flu-like illness. One of the key things is tachycardia out of proportion to the clinical findings. So you've got this person who comes in, they got a myalgia that looks like a flu-like picture, and their heart rate is 110, and they're an adult, and it's like the temperature is only 98, like, so that there's a discrepancy between the temperature and the, uh, and the heart rate, and that's kind of like the, one of the tip-offs. They also may be short of breath, so if, they, if, you, if they're short of breath, and you maybe hear a rail or two, and basically the heart's going a little faster than you think it ought to, uh, you need to think of myocarditis. It's not a common diagnosis, but it's an important diagnosis because um, there is the association. Of, it's a weak heart now. It's an infected heart. So you get congestive heart failure, dysrhythmias, and sudden death. One of my, a friend of mine who was like the total jock, did everything right, exercise, eating, uh, you, everything, everything, everything. He developed a myocarditis out of the blue. You know, got a viral my myocarditis. But he was still um, convinced that he wanted to maintain his health and do his exercises, and that was a good thing to do. And he was out jogging, and uh, he dropped dead. That was one of the consequences of his myocarditis. There were a thousand people at his funeral. And then talk about sudden deaths in young people, myocarditis. It's one of the scary kinds of things when uh, somebody comes into the uh, ER, a little kid, a little kid comes in, five, six-year-old kid, got a fever, disproportionate tachycardia, disproportionate tachycardia, uh, a shorter breath. You might listen to the lungs and say, oh, geez, I think I may be hearing something here. So those kids get uh, myocarditis, and they have the issue of sudden death as well. So, and, you know, there's a needle in the haystack. How many kids come in who are going to have this? One in a thousand. Um, but they do, and, and kids get myocarditis just like adults can. It's a viral illness in the majority of cases. The, the EKG is not going to have localized findings like uh, Jess pointed out. The fused T waves, the entire heart is sick. So it's all, all the T waves uh, in the EKG are going to be screwed up. Troponin leak, yes, these cells are sick. These cells are sick. They're not ischemic, they're sick. So they're leaking out their troponin uh, in, the, in this process. So that's kind of like maybe a tip-off. So you maybe have this person that you're concerned about. Get that troponin. Get that EKG. You see this EKG with T waves all over the place that are screwed up. You've made the, made the diagnosis. Unfortunately, it's not clear exactly how to fix the problem. Um, and then there are some markers of uh, inflammation, CRP and, and, and SED rates. I'm going to do a cardiac MRI, uh, I guess. That's how you make the diagnosis. It basically shows you that your, 
your heart's in flame. You're, but obviously by that time you're talking to cardiologists and getting, getting some uh, specialized help here. Treatment is symptomatic. Here's e T waves all over the place. No, they're not just anterior, posterior, lateral. They're all over. Um, pericarditis basically is uh, inflammation of the pericardium, the, the bag that surrounds the heart, and basically it is, causes some classic symptoms. Uh, inflammation is, uh, you know, viral pericarditis, uremic pericarditis. Uh, the, there's, a, uh, there's a goodly list of things that will cause pericarditis. The patients get pain that are is basically between their shoulder blades. When they sit up and lean forward, they feel best. That, and actually, that's the best place for you to listen to the rub, having them sitting up, le leaning forward, and hopefully you'll hear a rub then. Uh, and, and pain is worse when they're lying down. Pain is worse if they, uh, if they swallow, if they make certain movements, it is worse, which is certainly not typical of any cardiogenic kind of pain that you would expect. There is this pain that comes on a couple weeks after a heart attack, uh, which we call uh, Dressler syndrome, which is a my, uh, pericarditis as well. It's treated with uh, NSAIDs, basically. Uh, here's a little picture, you know, no big uh, deal. Here's a di differential of, the, with, of MIPE and pericarditis. It's, they're, they're pretty straightforward. I don't think there's a big, oh my uh, God, these, are, these are really could be con misconstrued. Um, I went, through the, I went through these findings already. Physical exam, you got this front friction rub, uh, if, you're, if you're lucky. Everything, it, you know, when, whenever the heart is compromised, it, it beats faster. Because uh, that's, you know, it, it, either, it pumps and it's got a rhythm. Pumps and it's got a rhythm. So the idea is if, I'm, if I get a sick heart, one of the ways I fix a sick heart in terms of pumping out blood is I pump it out faster. So that uh, these, you know, Disproportionate tachycardia is uh, kind of the red flag of these, uh, of these conditions, which are not common, but which you need to make the diagnosis of. In this case, there's the, the um, diffuse ST uh, elevation all over. Epic, why is it elevation? Because this is, the, this is a kind of like on the surface uh, of, the, of the heart. So elevation, ST, all over the place. There you go. And also, you can see a tachycardia here. So tachycardia, ST elevation, um, I'm thinking of pericarditis. Uh, basically, giving some anti-inflammatories are considered the treatment for those where there's no specific diagnosis. Um, complications, yeah, you can get a dysrhythmia. Tamponade, I'll talk about tamponade right there. Basically, you got so much fluid that's uh, leaking out of the, the, the pericardium is generating all of this fluid that is now compressing the heart. So you get this big bag, it looks like a big bag. Ultrasound will make this diagnosis instantaneously. It'll show you wall, fluid, heart. And um, the clinical signs of this are basically this, when this heart is in this bag, it doesn't load very well, it doesn't pump out very well. So it doesn't load very well, you start getting neck vein distension kind of thing. Uh, the signs of right-sided right failure, because the heart's not loading, it is being compressed. Um, when you try to listen, the heart sounds are very distant and muffled. EKG, the complexes are this tiny because you got all this insulation between the heart and the, and the leads of the EKG. Um, the pulses paradoxicus can occur. When you take a deep breath, you, uh, when you take a deep breath, you uh, suck air into your lungs. But you also suck blood into your lungs. So you, you've created a vacuum. Take a deep breath, you make a vacuum, blood flows up into your lungs and air fills up. So when you take a deep breath, your blood, systolic blood pressure goes down because you've just taken blood and moved it into your lungs rather than your heart. You exhale, air goes out, and blood goes out. Where the blood goes out to goes out to the heart. So there's a, a, a variation in blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury um, related to your Deep breath in, deep breath, uh, uh, breath out changes your blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. If you have an exaggeration of that, and if you have a 20 millimeter difference, that's called pulses paradoxicus. It's not paradoxical at all. It's, a, it's an exaggeration of the normal effect, so I'm changing the name to pulses exaggeraticus. <laughs> and uh, one of the other things that, just like they have this variation in in blood pressure, 
systolic blood sugar up, down, up, down. They also, you look at this thing where they have electrical alternance, beat to beat alteration in the, amplitude, in the amplitude of the QRS. Beat to beat variation in the amplitude of the QRS. Well, what, is that, what else is changing beat to beat variation in the heartbeat? It's this, it's this systolic blood pressure that's going up and down in an exaggerated format. Echocardiogram makes a diagnosis. Uh, and, that's, and that's it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.